So, um, since this is also going to be a talk about time and space, we should more or less keep to time, and we're being told to um, reach the stage. So, um, my name is Luisa Białosiewicz. I'm a political geographer. Um, I'm a professor of European governance at the University of Amsterdam and a frequent visitor to the IVM. I'll define myself as such. Um, I think the first time that I arrived at the Institute was in the fall of 2015, so quite a while ago. Um, that time as a Bronislav Geremek Fellow, and I've been fortunate to return um, several times since. And today, in this conversation that I'm very glad that many of you are joining us for, I'm going to be discussing together um, with um, a long-term colleague and friend, um, Professor Jan Zielonka, who is Professor of Politics and International Relations at Oxford University and at Kafowskari, the University of Venice. And the pretext for the conversation is Jan's new book, but we will be talking about many other things that I think also spill beyond the book. So, Jan, if you want to join me on the stage. Um, we, we will do this quite informally. We would like to do this quite informally, and since this is supposed to be indeed a conversation. Um, so taking about 30, 35 minutes for our discussion to make sure that we have sufficient time to tackle these questions with the rest of you, since it's supposed to be a conversation. So as I said, um, this book, The Lost Future, was the excuse, as it may be, for the conversation. Um, and I guess we wanted to start from the book, um, because the book, in a sense, has a slightly different focus than previous books that you have written, Jan, that have focused on everything from the disintegration of the European Union, um, had this wonderful book that we actually discussed in Amsterdam as well, is the EU doomed. Um, you've written about the threat of populism, about the challenges of digitalization. Um, this book is different, I guess, in, in many ways, um, but I think you know, the, what perhaps concerns us most here today is that you seem to suggest here that it's not just the populists that are to blame for our sorry state, um, but also the so-called Democrats, and in fact, the very nature of liberal democracy today, um, the structures of liberal democracy. And as a geographer, you know, I, I think what I really appreciated about this was precisely the focus on this kind of disconnect between the spatial forms that democracy has taken, that it still takes, I mean, forms that we have in many ways inherited but are completely mismatched to the challenges of today. Um, and the inability of those structures, of those forms, of the things that we've gotten used to calling, you know, kind of the frameworks, but also the, the processes of uh, representative democracy to, to govern and to offer a future, and thus the title, The Lost Future. So um, why, why is this different? Apart from one of the things that I loved the most about this book, which are the cartoons by Andrzej Mleczko, if any of you know this wonderful Polish cartoonist. Um, I think there's, you know, so there's kind of almost two books in one book because that, you know, kind of provides, I think, another narrative. So why, why this book? Which at the end was actually quite depressing, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> No, look. <laughs> Give us some hope. All Let's those, start. All of, when, each time people ask me, are you optimist or pessimist, I recall this, uh, this anecdote of, of, of President Yeltsin talking about competition in next room. Uh, uh, President Yeltsin, could you in one word describe the situation in Russia? Good. Or maybe in two words, no good. <laughs> so I don't put myself in this quadrant. Look, I had grown up in a country that was not democracy. We were dreaming about democracy. The dream came true. And we realized that something is going wrong. That, 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 that we are, three decades later, uh, not 
where we want it to be, whereas we see similar things even in a country which claims to be a champion of democracy, America, right? Not to mention Great Britain. Yeah? They have some competition in this sense. But, uh, you know, like many of you, I try to look at markets as culprits. I like to look at parliamentary representations and what has happened with it. In my last book, I dealt with populists. I didn't call them this way, but, but basically I wrote about them. But when COVID came, I realized that maybe I, we look too much at a tree rather than a forest. Uh, and I always studied time, but of course lockdown was a particular experience in terms of space. But also I realized that all our plans, everything from one day to another just evaporated. So the, 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 the issue of time has, been, has become crucial, but also how quickly we get vaccines, how quickly we can overcome and economically everything. So, so the pressure of time and an emergency situation made me think in different terms. And frankly, then I realized that, that politics is not very good to grasp time and space. And you know, I never was interested in time in the sense this was for, for, for physicists or, or philosophers rather than political scientists. But, but then you ask yourself, how come that those governments take one decision after another about climate change? We make all these pledges. But at the end of the day, they pedal back each time. Or how come that we all want to arrest inequalities and they grow on, if you look at statistics, all these years? Or how come basically that young people turn their back to democracy, to voting? How come? Is there nothing for them in democracy? Do they really don't care? And then I started to study those issues more seriously. I came to the conclusion that the democracy is myopic. Actually, the, the Italian edition is called Democrazia Myopa, short-sighted in, in, in terms of time and space. In terms of space, because it is constrained to national border chiefly at a time when most issues have local or transnational character. Even when our leaders go to the European uh, table, they defend their national interests. They come back to the country's capitals and say, I, I arrange this and this, you know. And sacrificing European interests as such and ending up with kind of common denominator which, which doesn't solve any problem. Uh, but, it, but democracy is also short-sighted in terms of time because it is a prisoner or a hostage of voters of the current generation. So when tough decisions, you know, they all, when the elections come, they make pictures with babies, you know, they say we are going to safeguard future of our children and our grandchildren. But when tough decisions have to be made, who is going to win? Pensioners, like myself, you know, because we are voting, we are in majority because of demography. And, 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 and those, Young people either gave up on voting very often, but those who still have no right to vote or who are still not yet born are going to live with our decision. So each time the government increases public debt, it basically assumes that the young gener future generation will pay. Each time they basically ignore another pledge on climate change, you know, 
uh, for somebody who is uh, like me, nearly 70, uh, okay, uh, we will struggle, I can tell you, and in my Tuscan house uh, in August, 45 degrees can be tough. But we survive. But can you imagine our children or grandchildren if things will continue? A pension system, public health system, even in country which is so wealthy like like Austria, I'm not even talking about the other. So there is a problem. Of course, we knew that there was a problem. But we, what is new is the digital revolution. Because the digital revolution has totally revolutionized time and space. But democracy hardly took notice. What were democratic reforms since the rise of the internet? So I started to think in different terms, and, and it didn't come naturally to me, you see, because I was born in a country where the notions of... <coughs> Did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that the notion of Space is having state a... and nation were sacred. But since I wrote this book in Venice, I learned that things could be very different that we are actually, in this internet era, much more resembling no medieval Europe with authority being dispersed, and where hard borders were hardly ever uh, pronounced, and the notions of time was different, than in, in the previous two centuries, where states were the you know, only uh, uh, basically enjoy monopoly on power and decision making. So, so this is where we are. And the book is about various things, you know, I, I never wrote before. Nomads and settlers, caves, bubbles, and eco chambers, accelerate high speed society, the, the how past is being uh, redesigned to project the future and that kind of things. And networks in particular, because all studies of internet show that the networks are the greatest beneficiaries of digitalization at the expense of highly bureaucratic institutional states. So we have to do something about this because otherwise, you know, we are not getting very far. In other words, yes, democracy has to be participatory, transparent and responsive, but it also has to sort out problems of, of citizens. This is what citizens expect from them. And if democracy fails to address those major problems, like wars, like uh, 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 climate change, like, like viruses, pandemics, well, there is a problem. And in fact, in this last sentence I say, if you look at governments in Europe for the, for the last several years, since financial crisis, at, at, at least, they all run by decree. Because there was one crisis after another. Financial crisis, migratory crisis, the, uh, then pandemia, then war, and, and they had to, to, to fix things. Parliaments are totally sidelined these days, and all the check and balances do not work regardless of who is in power because they have to address problems as they are. And they run basically you know, in the dark. Well, this cannot continue. But our democra democratic institutions are not well suited to cope with those problems, this accelerated pace and unbounded environment with the structures we have. And this is what I try to put forward. It is not as sexy as to talk about, you know, uh, uh, Meloni, Kaczynski, or. Uh, other colorful uh, figures <laughs> we, we have, or, or Trump. Yes. But I thought 
this is my job to put it forward. But in a sense, those figures are connected. And I guess, you know, kind of thinking back to the title of this edition of the Humanities Festival, Promises and Temptations, you know, kind of in thinking back to what you just said, that we've, we've been basically governing through crisis, you know, through emergency, whether by decree or by even appealing to the notion of crisis, which justifies a whole series of interventions. And yet those forms of governance are, as you know, I think you describe really well in the book, completely antiquated because you're trying to govern flows, whether viral flows, um, digital flows, um, even you know, new forms of warfare that you know, kind of territorial forms of governance cannot capture. I mean, you know, just think of the, you, know, you, you write here about the pandemic, about the absurdity of the first reactions of shutting down borders. I mean, this, you know, kind of very um, nation-state-centric, very kind of modernist, you know, kind of gut reaction, okay, let's put the borders down as though, you know, that would stop the virus from traveling. Because, of course, you know, we all know viruses always come from other people from abroad. Um, and, you know, and that was the assumption. I mean, I'm not talking about specific local lockdowns, but the fact that Schengen is immediately suspended and, you know, all other international borders come down. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking of that as an example that you give here, because even, you know, attempts to, I won't say govern climate change, because we're in a sense too late for that, but to somehow engage with these challenges that, you know, as you say, cannot be national. And yet, the trap is there, both the presumption that we govern in nice little neat territorial containers, but also with a very presentist concern, because, as you were just saying, you are bound to the next electoral cycle. And well, considering how many elections we have hanging very soon in this country, in Italy, in Poland, and there we come to the figures um, that you mentioned, whether it's the Melonis, the Kaczynskis, or, you know, take your pick of of figures who do promise a different future. I mean, they are false promises, but you know, they seem to be getting voted into office, so those promises are working. Look, this is the irony of history, that at the time that the territory of nation state doesn't correspond as before to what is going on the ground, we are calling, the, we are calling, I mean, people calling for return of the state mm -hmm. uh, and they are winning more votes than ever. This is the irony of history. Uh, because, but if you don't have solutions to sort out problems of the future, you try to find solutions trying to go back to the familiar past. But in my view, it's a water under the bridge, as the English say. You just, I can imagine the world without democracy, but I cannot imagine the world without the internet. Sorry. And this is the predicament of our times. So if we want to protect democracy, we have to adjust it to the new world. Look, and, and, but, but COVID shows not only transnational aspects, but also local aspects. Because actually, uh, uh, all pandemics uh, requires restricting space. I mean, I, I come from Venice. They invented in Middle Ages the term quarantena. So you are locked out 40, 40 days, yeah? Uh, but the point is that you don't lock down national borders, but you lock down borders around Codonio. This is where this uh, eruption of, of uh, in a small place, no Italian politicians visited before COVID, in a small place, actually in Veneto, where they had a lot of uh, uh, Chinese workforce and businesses international, so the COVID uh, 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 arrived uh, uh, area. There was this outbreak in a small uh, uh, city, uh, but but this was not the only border contested in Italy. Immediately, when when the breakdown after uh, uh, the small Venetian uh, uh, part, then there were 
large cities in Lombardy and Milano. And, and people, rich people in particular, tried to flee to Campania, to Ischia, to, 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 to Capri, to their summer houses. They wanted to escape big city. Yeah? And then the, 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 the president of the region of Campania, Luca, quite colorful man, <laughs> said, no, 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 no. We don't want those people from Lombardy here. I'm going to impose border on Catania. We used to have the other way around. The people from the north didn't want to have those from the south. And then the, it was the other way around, you know. And then uh, uh, my president of Veneto, also one of the sovereignists, said, I'm not going to wait for Rome to, to, or, or Brussels to arrange me vaccines. I'm going to call Putin directly and get Sputnik. So you see how the local dimension immediately went to f in front. And then, of course, they realized, OK, if we negotiate with these big pharma uh, vaccines on our own, the only the rich countries get and large will get it, and, and, and the others will pay double price and get it much later, and, and thousands of people will die. So they asked the commission to negotiate it. They were not very skillful in the beginning, but they did it much better than, than, than uh, vaccine nationalism would, would, would imply. And they, of course, then there were economic costs, and who is going to help those enterprises? And then COVID recovery fund. Well, I, I'm a beneficiary of the fund because I transformed my house into a totally ecological uh, uh, one with solar energy, even powering a car now for free. But what I want to say is that that this pandemic showed us very clearly how the issue of time and space is, 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 is fundamental to politics. But look at other things. You, you, a few weeks ago, you read about this pro proposal of, of, of high tech, you know, of, 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 of mega uh, artificial intelligence firms uh, suggesting to governments six months moratorium for developing artificial intelligence. They thought this is historical offers. Six months for artificial intelligence, this is the solar era. In democracy, six months? They wouldn't get parliamentary committee to meet, let alone agree on anything. I mean, after the decade of, of, of debate within the European Union, they agreed, okay, we, those companies have to, to self-regulate, and if they, uh, they should censor us, in other words, you know, and if they don't censor us properly, we will impose fines for them. Well, I don't want to be censored by, by, by high-tech companies. Where is the public discussion? Or look at your neighbor country, Switzerland. Recent deal between UBS and Credit Suisse. Country of referenda, eh? They have referendum on everything. But they cooked this deal between government, regulatory agency, and, and the banks from Saturday evening to Sunday uh, morning. Eh? Boom. Millions or billions passed hands. But if they wouldn't do this, the price will be enormous. And people don't want to pay this price. You see? But but so we are living in a situation that, that democracy, whoever is in charge, and of course I prefer that enlightened, educated people and not thieves uh, and, and, and demagogues are in charge. But even if, if, if uh, let's put it, our people win, they are not able to deliver. And this is the biggest danger. This is the biggest danger you see in America. Who will come after Biden? Hmm? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think we are all, I think, around the world concerned about the potential, if not of a next Trump presidency in the United States, of you know, maybe a DeSantis, let's take our pick. Um, but I think... In Europe, we have similar dangers. I mean, you know, dif different characters and perhaps not with that kind of weight. But I think to go back to, you know, the points that you were making, because, you know, once more following the pandemic, there was this great thing, oh, you know, European solidarity, whether regarding vaccine procurement, the recovery fund, now supposed European solidarity with um, respect to the support of the war effort. But 
it's all quite tenuous in time. Um, and I think, you know, what is striking is that unless it is very kind of forceful decisions taken in moments of crisis and justified with the fact that those are emergency decisions, democratic decision-making, I mean, and, you know, we can have another discussion whether EU institutions can be considered democratic, but even, let's say, of the good, the, the good guys, I don't know if I like that phrase, of, of those we would prefer, who consider themselves Democrats and not demagogues, you know, I, I think that those forms of governance are still very much governance through crisis. And, but I do, I'm, I'm not sure if I agree with you that only digitalization and the internet is to blame, because I think there are so many other processes, whether it is economic processes, I think we cannot remove political economy out of it. It's not just the digital economy, it's also political economy. And the reason that many people across Europe are turning to demagogues is because they promise easy solutions um, and they identify, you know, not only the usual scapegoats, whether it's migrants, um, you know, or um, big corporations, but, you know, a whole set of other scapegoats. But this is, a, this is in this sense, this is a very typical process of, of, of your political history. Because political history is an interplay between four factors, which is territory, authority, identity, and rights. And if you have what I call four unbounding revolutions uh, over the last three decades. First, geopolitical, you know, fall of Soviet Union, uh, Yugoslavia, and then Arab uh, Spring, and so Not only military alliances moved uh, to, uh, all over, but also ideologies and everything uh, just basically produced mishmash. Then you had economic unbounding revolution, not just globalization, but also single market. It's, it's a very unbounding revolution in economic terms. Then you had uh, COVID, and of course digitalization. So the reaction is rebounding, always in the history. The response was rebounding. And in fact, nation states in the 17th century prevail over our medieval units because they were able, and all people who wrote about state formation uh, uh, point to this, is that they were able to provide overlap between legal borders, economic borders, cultural ones, and military ones. And for a long period of history, you know, there was nation states basically within those borders uh, under central government and they overlapped. They, they, could, uh, they could steer uh, economic transactions, they could control um, uh, uh, the communication through, through school, uh, school system, the church, and, and, and of course, uh, um, administrative arrangement and so But this is no longer the case. I mean, Brexit was about bringing power back to Westminster. I mean, when Westminster selected Lee Strass as prime minister, who decided to embark on policies which markets didn't like, how many dates it took them to, to get rid of her? The famous letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember when Mitterrand tried to challenge market in the early 80s, it, it, it took markets at least half a year for him to, to pedal back. And now, several days. Who is mistrust? <laughs> but, you know, but this is the whole thing, is that, you know, we, nation states, as you're saying, I mean, apart from this kind of historical accrual of functions, you know, that, that came together in this container, they worked, and they worked for so long because they made sense, because they were able to offer protection to the citizenry, protection from outside threats. They were then able to, you know, kind of provide some form of social, political welfare, but we still cling to them, and they still are this of promise, to, you know, to which the populists of, of you know, of but, all stripes appeal. I'm the last one who would uh, uh, subscribe uh, uh, to the tier of withering away of states. States are there, and they will stay. 
But we have to understand that they change with technological and social changes. And we have to adjust those institutions accordingly. What we have now and what I find problematic, that states have monopoly on decisions and resources. They control the EU. They control all transnational organizations, UN, whatever. You know, and it doesn't have to be this way. Particularly if you see that other public actors uh, can uh, make a contributions to public goods much more effectively and quickly. You know, take for instance the issue of migration. Poland. Poland government opened borders to migrants. For one way or another, solidarity gesture, now they pedal back on this, but initially open border. But they didn't do anything for these millions of migrants from Ukraine. Who had to, uh, to, to, to find housing for them? Uh, uh, food, medicine, schools, city councils, which the government considers as enemies, NGOs, which they criminalize in the meantime, you know? Uh, those, those actors, which, which basically do not have either power or resources, had to clean the dishes. And, and, and it is on, on, on many other issues uh, in how it functions. And you know, I, I give you Dutch example. Uh, I recently talked uh, in Amsterdam, in your city, uh, to, to people from the council, and, and the sovereignist government of different type, you know, said housing first for, for the Dutch and not for, for, for immigrants. But they are not going to implement it. Why? Because people will sleep on the streets. There will be health problems, criminality, all other, all other things, which of course, government, they will say, oh, no, it's impossible, you have to handle it. But they didn't get any resources, they just got legislations, which is totally inappropriate to the circumstances. So this is what I want to say, that, um, uh, that we should open up our government and, and not treat um, other actors as, as either nuisance or agents who have to implement uh, the, the, the will of the government of the day. And, and we, have, we can find a way to do this. And when I worked for Solidarność, I was, I was uh, going with, with international trade unions to Geneva to international labor organization. And I've noticed that states do not have to control all negotiations. Because in the ILO, you had representative of states, employers, and employees. Eh? And they have to reach agreement for any labor regulation. What is wrong with that kind of idea? Or if we would have a second chamber of parliament, not composed of national uh, uh, parliamentarians, as it is proposed, but of NGOs, of, of city councils, even of firms, I prefer that businesses argue the case in European uh, Parliament than in the restaurants near Place Schumann, yeah? So, so we can open it. I'm not very revolutionary about this thinking, but the idea that the only way to, to, to improve democracy is to come back to the world which doesn't exist any longer, because this is what our uh, uh, authorities on democracy say, oh, we have to come back to the civil society, how it was, you know, we have to come back to political parties rooted in, 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 in the constituency. Good luck. Eh? Because yeah. people don't get their values any longer from the church or school. They, can, they get it from here. Which makes, um, and I don't even want to, you know, think if we want to use even democracy, but even represent forms of representation. Um, you know, kind of thinking of representation of justice makes it very, very difficult. I mean, I'll just say this, and then I'd really like to open it up to to you um, in the audience. I think you know the problem is that a lot of the solutions have been simply scaling down, right? So states are not or scaling down or scaling up, but mostly scaling down. You know, you were mentioning the role of cities, and this is a conversation that we've been having for quite a few years. You know, whether cities are the solution. I mean, certainly in the case of migration, that's where, you know, kind of, you know, whether it's um, people on the move, the new arrivals, I mean, that's where it becomes most visible. Um, 
those are the places that actually have to deal with these issues. Um, and yet cities are always um, completely ensnared in national legislation because, you know, apart from you know, the etymology of the term citizenship, it's not cities that grant citizenship. And all attempts by cities to grant rights of residence, denizenship, are always precarious because the state can always intervene and it is the state ultimately that holds control over its borders and who comes in, who comes out, who can stay and who has to go. So the example of Amsterdam, which has a long running program um, called Bed, Bath and Bread, so providing kind of basic needs, shelter, access to food um, for undocumented migrants or those who have somehow fallen out of the system, it's a discretionary program, which means the state, the Dutch state, can intervene at any moment and cancel it. So it's kind of like, you know, we're kind of letting you do it, but if somebody is going to be deported, I mean, the city yeah. has no way of stopping. And so, you know, until... Sure. Though, you know, those forms of control, the monopoly on the use of violence and the monopoly on deciding the rights of mobility, um, those change. I mean, I think it's very hard to talk about different forms of representation. Yeah, I think we should allow uh, interventions from the, from, from the floor. But let me say this. Migration is a beautiful case which shows that our conceptions of time and space in politics totally misguided. Because you cannot, yeah. uh, you know, you can build a wall of a night uh, uh, but you never sort, uh, uh, and we built more walls in Europe in recent years than ever before '89. Yeah, but uh, but you don't sort uh, migrations on the wall. Uh, uh, you, 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 or a naval blockade. You know, which if you want to US. really uh, sort out migration, uh, uh, you get at least some kind of uh, uh, control. You have to address war famine and climate change, which generates migrants. And if you don't, and this takes not only resources, it takes time. You don't do it by decree. Eh? And we externalize our immigration policy by making ourselves hostage of autocrats like Erdogan or, or, or the current Tunisian Saeed, president yeah. or Libyan warlords. You know, and, and it's not for the first time because the, uh, Idi Amin was also getting our money, and, and each time uh, he needed more, he was releasing more, more, more migrants uh, um, uh, to Lampedusa. So we never learned from this experience. And how many countries we bomb and then left to local warlords? You know, as, as somebody who, who lived in Italy for a long time, you know, Libya is a beautiful example. I mean, and I, when I went to Tunisia after Arab Spring, which was the only democracy which, which was there, the EU was only interested, they told me, in, in keeping migrants out of the shore, while the real border was with, with Libya, where all people with guns and, and money were moving free, with all these uh, rather shady characters who were organizing all those things. But they were not interesting because there was a border between Tunisia and Libya, not between Tunisia and, and the EU. I mean, if you really... So, so, so basically, um, you have to get away from the status paradigm, including the paradigm that we transform nation state in European states, because this doesn't sort out the issue. Yeah? And it is also impossible in practice because those who control the European Union, which are member states, they are not going to commit a, a collective suicide and say, OK, all power to Brussels and we are now local government. And they will not do this. You may like it, you may dislike it. But, so, so, but I always say, if you cannot go up, you cannot go down, go sideways. <laughs> you remember militant Schweik? <laughs> so where where do we go sideways? Um, um, we've, I think we, we've thrown out I think more questions than solutions, um, but we would love to hear from you either with more questions or with solutions. I mean, I, I certainly don't have one. Um, so there are yeah there are a couple of questions here. I think the mic is on its way. Hello, my name is Julius. I'm a master student at Central European University here in Vienna. I just had a simple question. The Economist, in one of its early recent editions, published statistics that show that, in general, 
uh, more people today believe that capitalism and democracy are zero gain, or zero sum, so only some people can, if one person gains, another person loses. And so I wanted to pose a question, to, and I wanted to add, ask your comment on if we extend our institutions, democratic processes to uh, NGOs and to interest groups uh, at the EU, um, with them also thinking about zero, how do we prevent these institutions from being a tug of war for someone's gain and someone's loss? And so I wanted to ask your comment for that. Thank you. Look, there are things we can change and others with various results. There are things which, which emerge because of our own making. We create institutions to regulate uh, patience, greed, hatred, you know, uh, all these things we cannot, you know, th these are human features which we can somehow uh, uh, try to, uh, to alleviate by uh, institutional incentives or, or punishments. And, and there are various ways of doing those things. Look, uh, People often ask me the questions, you know, okay, city council can, uh, are closer to the people, the national governments, but, uh, but do you want, like uh, my late friend uh, Barber, to argue that if the mayors would run the world, uh, everything will be fine? No. I, I know personally two former mayors who turned prime minister, uh, Boris Johnson and Matteo Renzi. Thank you very much. Not really, uh, not really great you know, example. Which cities, you know, cities like states, uh, some are strong and effective and wise, and others are, are, are failed. I mean, uh, Germany is a state and Cyprus is a state. Eh? Uh, America is a state and Costa Rica is a state. So what I want to say, uh, and, and, and there are also states which are autocratic. You don't have to look far away. So what I want to say is that the, the unit doesn't tell me everything about their performance. Yeah, This is point one. Point two, those who usually uh, make a caricature of, 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 of democracy or, uh, for instance, in NGOs or, or global or cosmopolitan democracy, the idea died, right? You know, first of all, uh, they assume that democracy in NGO will work like in a nation state. No, democracy in the nation state is a very peculiar historical construction. My former boss, Darendorf, always believed that, that no state, no democracy. And, and many other the, the, uh, theories, uh, like Linz and Stepan, said the same. But they had some kind of democracy in mind. You don't think, you know, you, you expect a, 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 a business firm to be transparent uh, and fair towards its employees or sh shareholders, but you don't expect them to be democratic in terms like states. So, of course, the notion of democracy changes, uh, and, but, but the same people idealize at the same time the notions of, of, of democracy. I mean, as I told you, I, 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 I never work, I, I'm not a Confucius Institute fan, yeah? Uh, and I actually believe that all my you know, worry about democracy doesn't mean that autocracy will, will perform better because it's not enough to make decisions quickly. You have to make wise decisions and, and not quick, stupid decisions because quick, stupid decisions cause more harm than, than, than no decisions very often. So, but having said that, uh, we have to face reality. Look at the opinion polls. Uh, trust to institutions like uh, parliaments is, is lower. Even journal, you know, media uh, have you know, more support of the public than parliaments, and, and this is already very low. So, you know, uh, uh, if you look at other, uh, I start my book with, with citing statistics about how people look at the future, because People will say, okay, we're now in a crisis, but tomorrow we will overcome it because we are better suited as democracies to come with the future. 
90% of French believe that the future will be worse than, than today. Even in America, majority now thinks that the future will be worse. I mean, this tells you something, and even I have noticed in, in our national elections, we are passionate to make sure that the others don't win. But do we really believe that if our will win, things will get better? There is something here, you see? So we shouldn't add, look, we, my colleagues in political science uh, 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 discuss those in details, cartel parties, uh, the, the different modes of representation, participation, okay. I myself discussed in my previous book, but I decided that this is not enough. That you have to deal with the unit as such, because what for to have a unit which is very close to people's will, very responsive, like if they cannot fix anything. And it was already predicted by great theoreticians, Robert Dahl, in the early 90s. He wrote this beautiful uh, essay writing about the Danish referendum on Maastricht Treaty. And he wrote, look, the Danes, of course, can opt for government sovereign in Copenhagen because it's closer to them than Brussels, of course. Copenhagen is closer to Dens than Brussels. But they, so, so this is participation. But what about six system effectiveness? Because they can give a mandate to this government to do many things, but, but this government will not be able to, to go after those uh, uh, big pharma or, or, um, or uh, internet companies because it's simply powerless. Uh, so, so you need to balance system effectiveness with citizens' participation. Exactly because I said before, people don't only expect governments to be representative and responsive, they also expect that the government sort things out for them. And particularly now that they are scared. They are scared. We have war acts out uh, our borders. We, we, we have ecological disaster one after another. And, 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 and we only hope and pray that the next financial crisis will not come at the same time as, as, as this other cataclysm. But I think this is the whole point. I mean, to go back to your point of a zero, you know, kind of zero sum feeling, I mean, the feeling is real because, you know, standards of living have dropped because for all of us and for all of you who are younger than us, the world will be much worse. I mean, we are hurtling towards disaster, so it's very hard to believe even in those institutions which have shown themselves completely incapable of addressing, or at least, you know, very myopic. And I think that's why the Democrazia Miope is a much better title for the book. I didn't say that we are heading at the disaster. I think we I are. Wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that, because I don't know. And I don't yeah. believe in the historical materialists that we are condemned to positive or negative. No, you I'm, remember I'm, I'm what I, my suggestions of reality at the beginning. I don't know. But I know that unless we get grip over you know, the governance system, we are not going to do better. And of course, there, I don't dismiss all mainstream discussions about the health of democracy. I don't dismiss them. I, I, I take part in this, I write column uh, every second week when I discuss current affairs. But as an academic, it's my job to sometimes bring other things to the table because we are, I fear, walking a little in this circus, that we are not making progress. I don't assume that those governments who, for instance, take uh, uh, environment pledges, they just don't believe in climate change. I think they believe in climate change, but they have to make hard decisions. Not because if they will uh, you know, be, be hard on climate change, they will have to face big business, particularly, you know, uh, uh, fossil oil uh, uh, companies, and they will have to be hard on ordinary citizens who will have to pay for transformation too. So these are not easy decisions, but, but the system actually invites them to duck the problem to the new generation. And we try to address it 
by institutional engineering. It didn't work. We had Ombudsman for the future generations. We had in Hungary when it was still democratic. We had in Finland. We had in Finland special parliamentary committee. I talked to these people. Politicians never took them seriously. They were preparing a report nobody was taking notice of. Well, I mean, think of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which was, you know, this huge exercise, which, I mean, I can see somebody in the audience just shaking their head. I mean, what was this thing about? And what was, you know, with, I think, a lot of just energy and very real energy invested in it. But um, there was another question over here. And um, one, two, and you had your hand up as well. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Lars von Dassen. Uh, I'm from Sweden, and I was once your student in the early, late 1980s. At that time, the Soviet Union still existed when our course was over, the Soviet Union collapsed. Not because of our course, but <laughs> because of strong historical factors. Um, that was in Leiden. Uh, years have passed since then. I think there is... Uh, a couple of things that we need to remember with democracy. Democracy is a conflict resolution force. And there is not another one around that is better. That doesn't mean that democracy cannot be strengthened, but it is hard to think of a system of rule that is better and can do what democracy does. Um, but I'm, and I'm thinking that some of the things that you say are the weaknesses of democracies, namely that they're not up to speed and they're not the ones that set the agenda and form the societies. That's true. I mean, there are other things going on that do that. But maybe that is then the true virtue of democracy, that it is a time for then reflection and thinking it through. Well, now something new is happening with AI. Now something new is happening with... Uh, genetic modifications. We need to think it through what it means. Uh, that we, we take our time and, and, and then it takes, maybe it takes six months to get it through Parliament, etc., etc. But I would actually say it's one of the virtues of democracy that it does exactly that. Then I'm actually also more uh, optimistic about the roles of, of the, the add-on to democracy. I think I see it everywhere. I see it here in Austria, I see it in Sweden, I see it everywhere. Namely, that the NGOs are invited, maybe not to have a vote in Parliament, but to speak with government, government offices, speak with experts, be in touch with, with various uh, other organizations and authorities. Um, I work here for uh, an NGO that is related to the UN. The UN invites NGOs to all large and small meetings. Uh, NGOs have a platform. Just like you mentioned with the, the ILO and, and Celadarnos, as was the case earlier on. So I would say that a lot of good things are happening and a lot of good things that can be improved on. And, and after all, uh, the only kind of government that is maybe capable of transforming itself and thinking through what it is that new times demand, that is democracy, and it's not any other. But any reflections on that, I would be very happy for. Thank you. So thanks for that. Let's take a couple more questions, just because I want to make sure. So you are here in the front, and then one there. Thank you. I'm Benjamin. I'm studying photography <laughs> in Vienna. Um, I think my question is kind of maybe a bit connected to the previous one. I, like from my notes, um, you were saying like, uh, democracy can't keep up with the age of digi digitalization, the, the democratic institutions are not made up for our time, they have to uh, adapt to the cur current world, we have to open up the governments, but like, I was just wondering, what are, are there any suggestions also, or like, do you have, like as an, as an expert, of course it's a big, big, big question, but I was just wondering, like, what, like, how would you open them up, because there's this one example you made about to get businesses more into and the EU, uh, rather than having them making decisions in the restaurants. And uh, I wonder, aren't there already big corporations and businesses being very much involved in, <laughs> or like doing it themselves actually, in uh, policies and how things are going? So I was just wondering, like, how, for example, would you uh, change things so democracy is keeping up with the age of digitalization. Let's take one more, because there was one more up here, and then... 
Hi, Andreas Zivi from Switzerland. My remark is more in line with the one from the Swedish gentleman in the back. I take a, a big exception at your statement, which I understood like that, that the politicians do not really, that democracy does not deliver, or if you want to say it differently, that the politicians do not perform. I understand in Germany recently there was a poll and more than half or maybe even 60% of the Germans have the same opinion. Our politicians cannot solve our problems. And I think about that all day long and then I'm in this wonderful town of Vienna. We have a very well working infrastructure. We have good schools. We have medical equipment. Uh, I really wonder what do we expect from our governments and our politicians to perform. My view is that they have done an admirable job in, in performing. And you've spoken of crisis. The crisis were not of their making. Maybe the 2008 crisis was of the making of the American National Bank. Maybe, we don't know that. But the reaction of the, to the crisis was extremely performing, as was the reaction to the pandemic. We, I mean, our governments, our authorities managed to come to terms with this crisis within two years. And I wonder whether the current lack of trust in democracy and lack of, of, of especially among young people also in our system, uh, is not also partially due to this negativity bias, which you now showed on the podium, but which I read all the time about in the newspapers. I mean, we're only telling the bad stories, never the good stories. And even in my own behavior, I must say that very often I uh, schimpfen, what's that in German, in English, I, uh, I complain about the politicians and I get all fiery about the mistake which they did. But frankly speaking, I think overall they're doing a very good job. So since we're getting close on time, I did, did want to make sure that everybody got a word and then you, know, you all have to have a very quick round of responses. Hi, I'm Lavinia. I'm also working with the Humanities Festival. Thank you for the interesting talk. Just a really quick question, because you were talking about generation or our generation, next generation, whatever. What is your alternative? What do you suggest we do in the future? What is the alternative if, if this is not working, if, if democracy is not moving along with digitalization? What do you suggest? How should we continue to bring life to our children? Does it, is it even worth it? Maybe you could add it in a couple of sentences. Um, if there's no democracy, then so how you get do you see the future for us? Maybe you so you get a very ex also existential question, which you know, I mean, which is which is very real. I mean, you know, I mean, I'll just say one thing. I mean, I think all these answers depend for whom. I mean, things work and things are working really, really well for some people in some places, and I think this disconnect is very much there. But Jan. You get to answer all of these difficult so, questions. I have to be very brief. My answer to those who, <laughs> who insist that democracy is the only game in town and actually there is no reason for, for alarmism, my answer to them is very simple. If things are so good, why they are so bad? <laughs> you see, this is one. Uh, two, uh, you see, I don't, I never said that we should get rid of democracy. But I think we have, what I said is we have to adjust to new circumstances. So if you said there is no need for democratic experimentation, then we disagree. And some people openly say, forget about the experimentation, we have to come back to the democracy as it was. But you see, I look at history. Democracy changed over ages. It was, you know, in the city of Athens, it was basically deliberate, direct democracy among nobles. Then came nation states, and, 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 and democracy became a you know, feature of, 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 of nation states. Uh, I can believe, you know, women didn't have a vote till the Second, Second World War later in many European states. Eh? In Switzerland, by the way. And but also many others. So, you know, what I want to say is that it's not like this, that, that democracy is all, always the same. We change. 
uh, this. We, we made enormous efforts, not only successful, to, to, to introduce democracy at the European level. And, so, and in fact, what, what I cite often in my book are examples that those states which work hand in hand with other actors who are willing and able to contribute to public goods, they are more successful. The city of Vienna is one of the examples. In Holland, which you cited, you know Randstad. Randstad is not even, you know, this is the area between Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and Utrecht. It is not even statistics. It has no legal entity. But it's the engine of growth and innovation in Holland. No government would make any decisions without having Randstad in mind. So those are examples which show your way forward. Now, it is, it is, we, we are basically, and the last things, what I'm going to say, we, journalists in particular, they always ask you, so give me one or two solutions how to ch change things. You know, it is like you, you have those books at the airport, you know, how to become a millionaire of, of, a, of a month, yeah? Or how to lose 20 pounds in two weeks, yeah? It doesn't work, it, but it's a question of paradigm. First, you have to open yourself that we have to do something about it and experiment. You have to, this is intellectual challenge first, then only political. So, uh, in fact, I blame more intellectuals than politi politicians for the current paradigm because we are not good in showing alternative way to move forward. Some of those uh, uh, paths will be mistaken. Some things will not fly. But we have to do something before those who believe that going back to nation states and building walls will fix things and everything will be fine. Eh? Thank you very much. <laughs> eh? Well, and I think, you know, on this note, um, I think I, I would... I would <laughs> so, I know if that you know to to that question, and I think that's the whole point is you know we do have to imagine alternatives because others are doing it for us. I mean, there are plenty of people you know from the ones you've mentioned from um, you know Meloni to Kaczynski, we can kind of have our two <laughs> prime ministers here on stage with us um, who make those promises, so um, alternatives are much needed. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for your questions. Um, we're out of time, so thanks for giving us ideas for hopefully some alternatives or getting or pushing us in that direction and to be continued. And I will tell to young people one thing. At the end of the day, power is, not, is never in history given by enlightened leaders. Power is taken. I like that as a way of ending. <laughs> <laughs>